Chapter Five, Part One, of the Eight Strokes of the Clock. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linny. The Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc, Chapter Five, Part One. Thérèse and Germain. The weather was so mild at autumn that, on the twelfth of October, in the morning, several families still lingering in their villas at Etretat had gone down to the beach. The sea, lying between the cliffs and the clouds on the horizon, might have suggested the mountain lakes slumbering in the hollow of the enclosing rocks, were it not for that crispness in the air, and those pale, soft, and indefinite colors in the sky, which give a special charm to certain days in Normandy. "'It's delicious,' murmured Hortense. But the next moment she added, "'All the same, we did not come here to enjoy the spectacle of nature, or to wonder whether that huge stone-needle on our left was really at one time the home of Arsène Lupin.' "'We came here,' said Prince Renin, "'because of the conversation which I overheard a fortnight ago in a dining-car, between a man and a woman, a conversation of which I was unable to catch a single word. If those two people could have guessed, for an instant, that it was possible to hear a single word of what they were saying, they would not have spoken, for their conversation was one of extraordinary gravity and importance. But I have very sharp ears, and though I could not follow every sentence, I insist that we may be certain of two things. First, that man and woman, who are brother and sister, have an appointment at a quarter to twelve this morning, the twelfth of October, at the spot known as the Trois Mathildes, with a third person, who is married, and who wishes at all costs to recover his or her liberty. Secondly, this appointment, at which they will come to a final agreement, is to be followed this evening by a walk along the cliffs, when the third person will bring with him or her the man or woman, I can't definitely say which, whom they want to get rid of. That is the gist of the whole thing. Now, as I know a spot called the Trois Mathildes some way above Etretat, and as this is not an everyday name, we came down yesterday to thwart the plan of these objectionable persons. What plan? asked Hortense. For, after all, it's only your assumption that there's to be a victim, and that the victim is to be flung off the top of the cliffs. You yourself told me that you heard no allusion to a possible murder. That is so. But I heard some very plain words relating to the marriage of the brother or the sister with the wife or the husband of the third person, which implies the need for a crime. They were sitting on the terrace of the casino, facing the stairs which run down to the beach. They, therefore, overlooked the few privately owned cabins on the shingle, where a party of four men were playing bridge, while a group of ladies sat talking and knitting. A short distance away, and nearer to the sea, was another cabin, standing by itself and closed. Half a dozen bare-legged children were paddling in the water. No, said Hortense, all this autumnal sweetness and charm fails to attract me. I have so much faith in all your theories, that I can't help thinking, in spite of everything, of this dreadful problem. Which of these people yonder is threatened? Death has already selected its victim. Who is it? Is it that young, fair-haired woman, rocking herself and laughing? Is it that tall man over there, smoking his cigar? And which of them has the thought of murder hidden in his heart? All the people we see are quietly enjoying themselves. Yet death is prowling among them. "'Capital!' said Renin. "'You, too, are becoming enthusiastic. "'What did I tell you? "'The whole of life's an adventure. "'Nothing but adventure is worth while. "'At the first breath of coming events, "'there you are, quivering in every nerve. "'You share in all the tragedies stirring around you, "'and the feeling of mystery awakens in the depths of your being. "'See how closely you are observing that couple who have just arrived. "'You never can tell.' That may be the gentleman who proposes to do away with his wife, or perhaps the lady contemplates making away with her husband. The Dormeval? Never! 
a perfectly happy couple. Yesterday, at the hotel, I had a long talk with the wife, and you yourself. Oh, I played a round of golf with Jacques Dormeval, who rather fancies himself as an athlete, and I played at dolls with their two charming little girls. The Dormeval came up, and exchanged a few words with them. Madame Dormeval said that her two daughters had gone back to Paris that morning with their governess. Her husband, a great tall fellow with a yellow beard, carrying his blazer over his arm and puffing out his chest under a cellular shirt, complained of the heat. "'Have you the key of the cabin, Thérèse?' he asked his wife, when they had left Renine and Hortense, and stopped at the top of the stairs a few yards away. "'Here it is,' said the wife. "'Are you going to read your papers?' "'Yes, unless we go for a stroll.' "'I had rather wait till the afternoon. Do you mind? I have a lot of letters to write this morning.' "'Very well. We'll go on the cliff.' Hortense and Renine exchanged a glance of surprise. Was this suggestion accidental? Or had they before them, contrary to their expectations, the very couple of whom they were in search? Hortense tried to laugh. My heart is thumping, she said. Nevertheless, I absolutely refuse to believe in anything so improbable. My husband and I have never had the slightest quarrel, she said to me. No, it's quite clear that those two get on admirably. We shall see presently, at the Trois Mathildes, if one of them comes to meet the brother and sister. Monsieur Dormeval had gone down the stairs, while his wife stood leaning on the balustrade of the terrace. She had a beautiful, slender, supple figure. Her clear-cut profile was emphasized by a rather too prominent chin when at rest, and, when it was not smiling, the face gave an expression of sadness and suffering. "'Have you lost something, Jacques?' she called out to her husband, who was stooping over the shingle. "'Yes, the key,' he said. "'It slipped out of my hand.' She went down to him, and began to look also. For two or three minutes, as they sheared off to the right and remained close to the bottom of the undercliff, they were invisible to Hortense and Renine. Their voices were covered by the noise of a dispute which had arisen among the bridge players. They reappeared almost simultaneously. Madame Dormeval slowly climbed a few steps of the stairs, and then stopped, and turned her face towards the sea. Her husband had thrown his blazer over his shoulders, and was making for the isolated cabin. As he passed the bridge players, they asked him for a decision, pointing to their cards spread out upon the table. But... With a wave of the hand, he refused to give an opinion, and walked on, covered the thirty yards which divided them from the cabin, opened the door, and went in. Therese d'Ormeval came back to the terrace, and remained for ten minutes sitting on a bench. Then she came out through the casino. Hortense, on leaning forward, saw her entering one of the chalets annexed to the Hotel Hauville, and a moment later caught sight of her again on the balcony. Eleven o'clock, said Renin. Whoever it is, he or she, or one of the card players, or one of their wives, it won't be long before someone goes to the appointed place. Nevertheless, twenty minutes passed, and twenty-five, and no one stirred. Perhaps Madame Dormeval has gone? Hortense suggested anxiously. She is no longer on her balcony. If she is at the Trois Mathildes, said Renin, we will go and catch her there. He was rising to his feet, when a fresh discussion broke out among the bridge players, and one of them exclaimed, "'Let's put it to Dormeval.' "'Very well,' said his adversary. "'I'll accept his decision, if he consents to act as umpire. He was rather huffy just now.' They called out, "'Dormeval! Dormeval!' They then saw that Dormeval must have shut the door behind him, which kept him in the half-dark, the cabin being one of the sort that has no window." "'He's asleep!' cried one. "'Let's wake him up!' All four went to the cabin, began by calling to him, and, on receiving no answer, thumped on the door. "'Hi! Dormeval! Are you asleep?' On the terrace, Sergenin suddenly leapt to his feet, with so uneasy an air, that Hortense was astonished. He muttered, "'If only it's not too late!' And, when Hortense asked him what he meant, he tore down the steps and started running to the cabin. He reached it just as the bridge players were trying to break in the door. Stop, he ordered. Things must be done in the regular fashion. 
"'What things?' they asked. He examined the Venetian shutters at the top of each of the folding doors, and, on finding that one of the upper slats was partly broken, hung on as best as he could to the roof of the cabin, and cast a glance inside. Then he said to the four men, "'I was right in thinking that, if Monsieur Dormeval did not reply, he must have been prevented by some serious cause. There is every reason to believe that Monsieur Dormeval is wounded, or dead.' "'Dead!' they cried. "'What do you mean? He has only just left us.' Renin took out his knife, prized open the lock, and pulled back the two doors. There were shouts of dismay. Monsieur Dormeval was lying flat on his face, clutching his jacket and his newspaper in his hands. Blood was flowing from his back and staining his shirt. "'Oh!' said someone. "'He has killed himself!' "'How can he have killed himself?' said Renin. "'The wound is right in the middle of the back, at a place which the hand can't reach. And besides, there's not a knife in the cabin.' The others protested. "'If so, he has been murdered. But that's impossible. There has been nobody here. We should have seen, if there had been. Nobody could have passed us without our seeing.' The other men, all the ladies and the children paddling in the sea, had come running up. Renin allowed no one to enter the cabin, except a doctor who was present. But the doctor could only say that Monsieur Dormeval was dead, stabbed with a dagger. At that moment the mayor and the policeman arrived, together with some people of the village. After the usual enquiries, they carried away the body. A few persons went on ahead to break the news to Thérèse d'Ormeval, who was once more to be seen on her balcony. And so the tragedy had taken place without any clue to explain how a man, protected by a closed door with an uninjured lock, could have been murdered in the space of a few minutes, and in front of twenty witnesses, one might almost say twenty spectators. No one had entered the cabin, no one had come out of it. As for the dagger with which Monsieur Dormeval had been stabbed between the shoulders, it could not be traced. And all this would have suggested the idea of a trick of a slate of hand performed by a clever conjurer, had it not concerned a terrible murder, committed under the most mysterious conditions. Hortense was unable to follow, as Renin would have liked, the small party who were making for Madame Dormeval. She was paralyzed with excitement, and incapable of moving. It was the first time that her adventures with Renin had taken her into the very heart of the action, and that, instead of noting the consequences of a murder, or assisting in the pursuit of the criminals, she found herself confronted with the murder itself. It left her trembling all over, and she stammered, "'How horrible! The poor fellow! Ah, Renin!' You couldn't save him this time. And that's what upsets me more than anything, that we could and should have saved him since we knew of the plot. Renin made her sniff at a bottle of salts, and when she had quite recovered her composure, he said, while observing her attentively, So, you think that there is some connection between the murder and the plot which we were trying to frustrate? Certainly, said she, astonished at the question. Then, as that plot was hatched by a husband against his wife, or by a wife against her husband, you admit that Madame Dormeval— Oh, no, impossible, she said. To begin with, Madame Dormeval did not leave her rooms. And then I shall never believe that pretty woman capable— No, no, of course there was something else. What else? I don't know. You may have misunderstood what the brother and sister were saying to each other. You see— the murder has been committed under quite different conditions, at another hour and another place. And therefore, concluded Renin, the two cases are not in any way related. Oh, she said, there's no making it out. It's all so strange. Renin became a little satirical. My pupil is doing me no credit today, he said. Why, here is a perfectly simple story, unfolded before your eyes. You have seen it reeled off like a scene in the cinema, and it all remains as obscure to you as though you were hearing of an affair that happened in a cave a hundred miles away. Hortense was confounded. What are you saying? Do you mean that you have understood it? What clues have you to go by? Renin looked at his watch. 
"'I have not understood everything,' he said. "'The murder itself? The mere brittle murder? Yes. "'But the essential thing, that is to say, the psychology of the crime, "'I have no clue to that. "'Only it is twelve o'clock. "'The brother and sister, seeing no one come to the appointment at the Trois Mathildes, "'will go down to the beach. "'Don't you think that we shall learn something, then, of the accomplice whom I accuse them of having, "'and of the connection between the two cases?' They reached the esplanade in front of the Auville Chalet, with the capstans by which the fishermen haul up their boats to the beach. A number of inquisitive persons were standing outside the door of one of the chalets. Two coast guards, posted at the door, prevented them from entering. The mayor shouldered his way eagerly through the crowd. He was back from the post office, where he had been telephoning to Le Havre, to the office of the procurator general and had been told that the public prosecutor and an examining magistrate would come on to Etretat in the course of the afternoon. "'That leaves us plenty of time for lunch,' said Renin. "'The tragedy will not be enacted before two or three o'clock, and I have an idea that it will be sensational.' They hurried, nevertheless. Hortense, overwrought by fatigue and her desire to know what was happening, continually questioned Renin, who replied evasively, with his eyes turned to the esplanade, which they could see through the windows of the coffee-room. "'Are you watching for those two? asked Hortense. "'Yes, the brother and sister. "'Are you sure that they will venture? "'Look out! Here they come!' He went out quickly. Where the main street opened on the sea-front, a lady and gentleman were advancing with hesitating steps, as though unfamiliar with the place. The brother was a puny little man, with a shallow complexion. He was wearing a motoring cap. The sister, too, was short, but rather stout, and was wrapped in a large cloak. She struck them as a woman of a certain age, but still good-looking under the thin veil that covered her face. They saw the two groups of bystanders and drew nearer. Their gait betrayed uneasiness and hesitation. The sister asked a question of a seaman. At the first words of his answer, which no doubt conveyed the news of Tourmeval's death, she uttered a cry and tried to force her way through the crowd. The brother, learning in his turn what had happened, made great play with his elbows and shouted to the coast guards, "'I'm a friend of Dormeval's. Here's my card. Frédéric Astain. My sister, Germaine Astain, knows Madame Dormeval intimately. They were expecting us. We had an appointment.' They were allowed to pass. Renin, who had slipped behind them, followed them in without a word, accompanied by Hortense. The Dormeval had four bedrooms and a sitting-room on the second floor. The sister rushed into one of the rooms, and threw herself on her knees beside the bed, on which the corpse lay stretched. Thérèse Dormeval was in the sitting-room, and was sobbing in the midst of a small company of silent persons. The brother sat down beside her, eagerly seized her hands, and said, in a trembling voice, "'My poor friend! My poor friend!' Renin and Hortense gazed at the pair of them, and Hortense whispered, "'And she's supposed to have killed him for that? Impossible!' "'Nevertheless,' observed Renin, "'they are acquaintances, and we know that Astang and her sister were also acquainted with a third person who was her accomplice, so that—' "'It's impossible,' Hortense repeated. And, in spite of all presumption, she felt so much attracted by Thérèse that, when Frédéric Astang stood up, she proceeded straightway to sit down beside her, and consoled her in a gentle voice. The unhappy woman's tears distressed her profoundly. Renin, on the other hand, applied himself from the outset to watching the brother and sister, as though this were the only thing that mattered, and did not take his eyes off Frédéric Astaing, who, with an air of indifference, began to make a minute inspection of the premises, examining the sitting-room, going into all the bedrooms, mingling with the various groups of persons present, and asking questions about the manner in which the murder had been committed. Twice his sister came up and spoke to him. Then he went back to Madame Dormeval, and again sat down beside her, full of earnest sympathy. Lastly, in the lobby, he had a long conversation with his sister, after which they parted, like people who have come to a perfect understanding. Frédéric then left. These manoeuvres had lasted quite thirty or forty minutes. End of chapter 5, part 1